Hi, this is Eric from Longbox Review, a comic book podcast at longboxreview.com. Welcome to the show. Uh, to, I know this, uh, this particular comic that I'm going to talk about has been out for weeks, but I could not let this opportunity pass me by and uh, not talk about the landmark issue, Action Comics number 1000. So whenever people uh, that are not comic fans who know me find out that I love comic books and superheroes, they inevitably ask me, well, who's your favorite superhero? And without hesitation, my answer is always Superman. He's the first, uh, arguably the greatest. And I, you know, I just, I love Superman for what he stands for, probably more than uh, the particular adventures that he has in the comics. Um, so, you know, Superman has transcended, transcended what he is in the books to become a cultural icon. And that is what I really respond to. You know, Superman, a lot of people think of Superman as the big blue Boy Scout and that he's boring and, you, you know, all, the, all that kind of crap. Uh, I don't. I, I find Superman to be inspiring, something to aspire to uh, in the way that he has uh, in the way that he views the world at least as he's been portrayed over the years now of course various interpretations of superman by the various uh writers and artists that have rendered him over the decades um i don't always agree with every interpretation but the, kind of the conglomerate the accepted um well i shouldn't say that because other people have different viewpoints on superman but uh, what i think of as the accepted um, standard uh, that is Superman to me. And and I, I really just kind of look at it very simply. Superman is the guy who does the right thing all the time, despite what's going on. Uh, he's He is the, the person who does good and does good work and inspires others because of his altruistic viewpoint and his actions. And I, I just think that, you know, that's something to really, uh, to really look up to. And, um, that's, you know, that's why I like Superman. He's, he's a good, he's a good bean, as they used to say. <laughs> so, uh, I, of course I had to, I had to get Action Comics 1000 and, uh, read all the stories within. And I just kind of wanted to, to talk through those with you as have so many other, other comic book po- comic book podcasts that I listen to, um, but uh, this is this is my take. So um, I hope you enjoy this, and I, I look forward to any feedback I get uh, regarding these stories. So Action Comics one thousand. I tell you what, uh, seeing a four digit number on a comic book that I have in my hand is just, I think, really cool. And not to put too fine a point on it, DC Comics on the cover put landmark issue, just so you wouldn't miss that point. <laughs> uh, this is an 80-page giant. Unfortunately, it's $8, um, which is too bad, but oh well, that's that. I guess that's how, that's the price of comic books these days for, for this. Remember when 80-page giants used to be like really cheap and... uh well, that's not comics anymore, is it? So, but uh, you know, this is this is a a, a this is a, an examination and celebration of the past uh, regarding Superman. So, uh, uh, so I have the main cover, which is the Jim Lee cover with Superman standing there, uh, fists on on waist, with his cape blowing in the wind, you know, and he has the red shorts on, which that's nice. Um, I you know actually. I don't. I didn't care about the the short. I mean, when they first launched the new fifty two and they redesigned all the costumes and the shorts were gone and they had more of an armor looking, well, more of an armor look, uh, and and those collars. It was really the collars that I objected to, <laughs> just because why would all of these superheroes go to the same tailor? It just didn't make any sense to me. But uh, you know, that aside, I actually liked. I didn't at first. I will admit this. If you if you're a longtime listener and you listen to uh, uh, my reaction to the new Fifty Two announcements, I I did 
complain about Superman's costume, but more in the sense of uh, why did they do an armor-like looking costume as opposed to, you know, uh, what we see now on Superman, uh, which is the, the more traditional look. Um, but I did not really all that care or care all that much uh, regarding the shorts. Uh, I, I grew to really like the new 52 Superman look, including the, the, the S shield, the way that was, that was done. And of course now, you know, several years later, I guess it's about seven years later now, uh, we have the old Superman back. I mean, in, in many ways, it's the same Superman that we had pre flashpoint. So it's interesting how those things happen. (laughs) Uh, but anyway, we have, we have, I have here the Jim Lee drawn cover. Uh, you know, I don't really go in for all those variants. There was one variant and I don't remember, remember the artist right now. Shoot. But, uh, it was, it was, uh, Superman on, on basically a white background. It was just a gorgeously drawn, uh, image. And I, I, I should have written that down as to who that was, but I, I did. I did mention it on Twitter when I was talking about all the variant covers. There are several stories in here, of course. Let's see. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Ten entries in here, plus a couple pinups. And so I was just going to talk through those. So I, uh, the first story is from the city that has everything. Written and drawn by Dan Jurgens with inks by Norm Ratmund, colors by Hi Fi, letters by Rob Lee. Uh, this was a 15 page story, as is the next one. And then I think pretty much the rest of them are about five pages. We'll see. I had, uh, <laughs> I had actually read this story right after I read The Mighty Thor number 706, I believe. And so I was. I don't know. I was in a bit of a different emotional state uh, going into this first story by uh, Dan Jurgens, and um, the whole idea of Superman being celebrated by the city that he he protects, Metropolis, and uh, what his fellow superheroes, his friends, did for him for that day, really got to me. I'm like, yeah, this is this this feels good, right? Um, I really appreciate that, that someone is celebrating Superman instead of, you know, Batman. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, because Superman used to be the top seller for years and years. You know, he Superman was the comic book character that everybody bought. Batman, I think, at one point was almost canceled and Superman was going strong. And then, you know, after a few decades, that changed and, and uh, Batman's still going strong. So I always feel like Superman gets a lot of short shrift in comics, in the comic book community, the fans. I mean, there are obviously those like me who love the character, uh, but he doesn't have the the cachet that he used to have. So when I was reading this story, I was like, yeah, this this is how it's supposed to be for Superman. <laughs> so I really appreciated that. Um, the whole idea of of Lois talking. Oh, and by the way, if you haven't read this, I uh, will be talking about details. So you know the obvious spoiler warnings, I guess. But um, the way that I, that that uh, that Lois was talking to quote unquote Perry throughout the story, uh, you know, it was quite obvious from the, from the beginning that something was up, but you weren't quite sure. And what it turns out is that uh, Wonder Woman and a bunch of the superheroes including the Martian Manhunter, who does this weird thing that I'm going to mention in a minute, but they decide to protect the Earth, protect Metropolis, so that Superman doesn't have to. And Which I thought was really, really sweet. And there's this one splash page uh, that spills onto another page here, showing all of the heroes who have gathered to show their thanks or uh, express their thanks to Superman. I, I just really dug that. But yeah, so th- this was a really sweet, you know, kind of saccharine <laughs> story. But you know what? It it hit the right marks for me, uh, even if it was a little, you know, there wasn't much to this other than, hey, Superman's great. And don't you agree that Superman's great? And yes, I do. So there you go. Uh, but but to, to, <laughs> just, to, just to illustrate um, 
or, or just to point out the thing about Martian Manhunter. So, you know, I, it, it's not really the point of the story to, to get into some of these specifics, but I thought it was weird that Jurgens decided to use Martian Manhunter as a way to uh, pull the wool over Superman's eyes so he doesn't rush off to help people. Uh, because man, the Manhunter uses his telepathy to show s- or to uh, convince Superman that those threats aren't actually there so that the other heroes can can address it. And, and, and you know, Superman being Superman, he doesn't really question it. And, you know, like I said, it's a 15 page story, so there's not much room to really, and it's not the point to really get into that. But, you know, it's just, it's just an odd thing that the guy who stands for truth uh, among the, the justice and uh, uh, a good way of life, that um, he would be okay with the Ma- Manhunter doing that. I don't know. It's, it was weird. Wonder Woman 2, you know, it just seems like a weird choice, but, you know, it was to, to move the plot along, I guess you had to do something like that. And then there was the, like I said, that splash page showing everybody, which is a lot of Justice League members, uh, a lot of members of the Batman family, Green Lanterns, and Teen Titans, with a few extra odd characters showing up here as well, Uh, including, I think, in the background there is the new character Sideways. It looks like him. And more importantly, uh, is Deathstroke and Harley Quinn. (laughs) And I know Deathstroke in 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 his title, they were playing with the idea that he's trying to be a good guy now. I guess I don't read it, but that's kind of the gist I got. Uh, but uh, I don't know what's going on now. But all I know at the point of at the time of this recording, uh, there's there's a fight going on between Deathstroke and Batman. I don't know anything anything else about it, but I presume that Deathstroke is is uh, either back to his old tricks, which of course you know good villains you can't you can't always reform them forever um so i don't know i it's it was just weird to me then to see these two there are they anti-heroes now uh harley quinn seems to be uh but i'm not so sure about about deathstroke yet. anyway i just thought it was odd uh nice to see nightwing though in the picture of course who is my second favorite superhero of all time if it wasn't for superman he would be my uh, totally be my favorite but anyway that's that's what uh that's what i like about this story here uh, at the end, Lois, you know, to, again, to put a fine point out, Lois says, your father, Superman, he's, she's talking to John, their son, is the most understanding man I've ever met. He knows he shares a bond with Metropolis and that every now and then in appreciation for all he's given them, the people get to return the gesture. That's what makes him Superman. I don't know that that's what make him, makes him Superman. That's one part, I suppose. But anyway. All right. Uh, the next one is probably my favorite story in this book. So this is The Never-Ending Battle, uh, story and words by Peter Tomasi, art by Patrick Gleason, colors by Alejandro Sanchez, and colors by Tom Napolitano. This is a, um, I think it's a 15, another 15 page, yeah, 15 pages, 15 splash pages is what it is. Uh, this was really cool. Uh, the story is that Vandal Savage has found a way to, um, what was it here? He found a way to weaponize hypertime, and so Superman is trapped in a fabric of yesterdays, a loop that never ends, a loop that never crosses. Mine allows me to be victorious in the here and now. Uh, this is Vandal Savage talking. Uh, we will never meet again, Superman. Your future is in the past. So, uh, and so the rest. So this story is told from from Superman's point of view, and then what we get the rest of the pages is seeing Superman throughout various time periods and and it's it's really a celebration it's kind of meta it's really a celebration of him uh during or through his publishing uh time and so we see you know like early late 30s superman uh battling gangsters here in the first page and he talks a lot about superman talks a lot about you know what what is driving him what connects him it's and it's kind of neat because they they do reference hypertime uh, which is related to this, right? The Speed Force, or am I just totally making that connection up? But it reminded me, at least, of the Flash, uh, in regards to the Speed Force, in which if 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 a Flash gets stuck in the Speed Force, he needs an anchor to draw him back. And so that's what that's what Superman's talking about throughout his his um, his visits through these time periods. 
uh, through these hypertime periods. Uh, it's his family. It's Lois and John, who are whom whom he is working his way towards. He's fighting his way back. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, and then you know we see again uh, these splash pages showing him in the, I guess in the early forties, perhaps. Uh, you could tell by the, the way that the the S shield is drawn on his chest, you know, the different eras. Uh, we see him during World War II with Sergeant Rock here. Um, uh, some uh, funny outer space adventures with some uh, Lilliputian characters, <laughs> which was lovely. I love that little thing. Uh, fighting some underground creatures. I don't know. Uh, some of this stuff, I I don't. I don't know if it's based on actual stories or if it's just kind of an homage to stuff that has happened. Um, he's fighting a dragon here. So we're getting further on into the Lois is in this one, which is weird. So uh, Clark is fighting a dragon and, and it's burning off his clothes. You see this, the Superman suit underneath and Lois is right behind him in this sixties looking yellow outfit. And if, I thought, well, that's kind of strange to include Lois there because if he, what he's trying to do is get back to his family. I know it's, you know, his family now, his current, the current incarnation of his family, but I thought it was just kind of weird that they put Lois here. I, I would think that not having Lois there would um, accentuate this idea that he's trying to get back to his wife. But anyway, it doesn't matter. There's this great uh, page here where uh, supposedly Vandal Savage uh, knows that Superman is working his three, his way through hypertime, and what better way to stop him than other versions of himself? And so you get a uh, a Super Friends version looking character here, uh, along with another Superman. I'm not sure which which version that's supposed to be fighting him. Uh, you get a a Frank Miller Dark Knight homage with lightning striking Superman. He looks very much like he did in the Dark Knight Returns. Uh, after the nuclear explosion, you have him fighting, is that Silver Banshee, I believe? So we're now, you know, we're getting into the 90s here. Yep, 90s, because he's fighting Mongrel, and he's in the, the black suit after he died. And uh, this great, there's this great shot of, uh, I think it's Zod here, and Ursa, perhaps, with Superman in the Phantom Zone, but they're, they, they uh, Gleason portrayed it as uh, as the the way or in the way that they showed the Phantom Zone uh, in Superman the movie with that with that that rectangular um, uh, uh, viewpoint, I guess I don't I'm not sure you know it's kind of like a, a container, a two dimensional rectangular container, and Superman's trapped in it. I thought that was really cool. And you see you see um, is it supposed to be his fortress in the background or is that Krypton? I don't know. Uh, you get a you get um, a nice. Kingdom Come uh, shot here. So he's going all over through Hypertime. But of course, he gets, he gets back. He gets back and joins his family. Uh, it's his birthday, which I thought was really cool. There's like 10 million candles on there. Actually, I don't know. I should probably, I should probably count them. I, I wonder if they uh, add up to 80. And, and of course, Crypto's there. So I thought that was really cool. Now there's a pinup by uh, John Romita Jr., Jr., which I don't like. I don't think it's drawn very well, but you know, I'm not a big fan of, of Ramita Jr.'s. Uh, the next one is, the next story is An Enemy Within. It's, I think it's only five pages. Yeah, five pages story. This, so now we're getting into the shorter stories. This is a uh, script by Marv Wolfman, art by Kurt Swan, with ink, inks by uh, Butch Geis on pages one through four. And then Kurt Schavenberger does inks for page five, but uh, page five is actually taken from um, Superman, the secret years. Uh, so I guess as a way to cap that off, uh, of course they had to have something from Kurt Swan in here. I, I certainly don't mind that, but this is not one of the best stories here. Uh, I didn't, didn't really care for it. Um, but you know, it's basically this guy's holding this woman hostage, uh, threatening to kill her. Maggie Sawyer is there and she's doing the right thing in that she's not trying to, to, you know, eliminate the guy, but she's trying to stop him from doing, you know, making a bad choice. And it's not really his choice. He's under the control of Brainiac, we find out. And so again, the story is narrated by Superman. He's telling it after the fact of these events. Um, and, you know, and, and the reason I say Maggie's not trying to just eliminate the guy, she, she had the cops shoot him with rubber bullets to incapacitate him. 
so it's this this is a story not about Superman per se, but it's about the people of like Maggie, uh, the people of Metropolis, um, whom is inspired by Superman, but also inspires Superman. So I thought that was a nice a nice touch. Uh, the story ends with um, this little thing from Brainiac, basically uh, trying to take over this this garden. This guy who's messing with. No, I think it's. I think he's supposed to be a, a homeless guy, but he's messing with, with uh, some grass or something by this fountain. And Maggie walks by and offers to help him. Another, you know, another showing another compassionate human being here, uh, or not another one, but you know, showing Maggie is compassionate yet again. And but it, what what this really is 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 it's an odd way to end it because the the bit of dialogue here from Brainiac is that he's trying to take over this guy. But he can't. A connection attempt, drastic failure, project terminated offline, and and it goes and the story ends. But you know, so, so I guess the, I guess the uh, uh, the moral of the story is that human beings. Well, I mean, Superman even even says, you know, the, the the guy who is who held the woman hostage, he fought back. Brainiac's control wasn't perfect. So, yeah. So it's just it's just you know the human spirit, I guess. Yeah, uh, Superman himself says, Brainiac was doomed to lose because, simply put, mankind is stubborn. Yeah, they won't long bow down to any master. Compared to the natives of other worlds, their bodies are fragile, but it always amazes me how strong they can be. So there you go. Uh, The next story is The Car, written by Jeff Johns and a story by Jeff Johns and Richard Donner. Uh, artist is, is Olivier Co- uh, Coipel. Alejandro Sanchez on colors says special thanks to Matt Wilson, I guess for colors. Uh, Nick Na- uh, Napolitano on letters. And this is a fun one because this is told from the perspective of one of the guys that was in the car uh, from Superman's first appearance. So you remember that the iconic Action Comics number one cover where he's smashing a car into into a hill or a wall or i forget now so this is one of those guys so so the car is in the shop the one the guy one of the guys is is there you know the mechanic is asking what happened we see a, a, a flash of superman standing there uh and the guy says a man wearing red underwear and the, guy, and, the and the mechanic says you got to lay out the sauce for a while pal <laughs> anyway so uh apparently superman put this guy on a telephone pole he crawled down and um and uh, why he took the car back to the mechanic, I don't know. But anyway, he did. Uh, and so he's just kind of waiting around for for the guy to fix his car. But the car is so messed up, there's no way. This, this is not going to happen anytime soon. And there's this great shot here. So he's walking around basically a junkyard. And he looks up and sees a bird. Looks over and sees a plane. And then he looks behind him. And it's Superman. I thought that, I thought that was really cool what they did there. What... Uh, uh, Mr. Coypel does because, you know, it's a bird, it's a plane. <laughs> I, just, I love that. And so then Superman shows up and he says, I went back to the telephone pole, but you were gone. I've met a lot of men like you, Butch, hot shots with big mouths and the muscle to back them up. You get away with just about any everything you want, pushing the little guy around. Um, some might say you deserve to be back on that telephone or something higher. You know, that, that touches on how Superman was a little more less under or less a little more less he was a little less understanding of criminals back in the early days um and you know didn't hesitate to just beat up a guy f- for little provocation uh so you know but here they they do they do tone it down a little bit uh so superman did some digging on the guy you know the the compassion of superman here and he realizes uh that the guy's had he says here you've had your fair share of knocks uh, and you can keep knocking the world back like you've done, or you can make a decision today. Be the person who wasn't there for you for someone else. It's your life, Butch. You can fix it, or you can junk it. It doesn't have to be more complicated than that. See you around. And so Butch thinks about it, and then the last panel is him uh, in the city um, uh, opening up a fire hydrant to to allow the kids of the neighborhood to cool off and have some fun. So uh, supposedly he's turned a new leaf, as they say. Uh, the next story is by 
Scott Snyder with art by Raphael Albuquerque, uh, colors by Dave McCaig, letters by Tom Napolitano. It's called The Fifth Season. And I have to admit, I had to reread this one a couple times because I wasn't quite getting what Snyder was going for with this whole fifth season thing. But then I realized I was just, I was missing the obvious. But this is an encounter between Superman and Lex Luthor at the Smallville Planetarium. And, you know, you put a planetarium in a story or put me in a planetarium and I'm just happy. Uh, But uh, it's them talking. Uh, Lex has acquired the Eye of Zotar and Cronus's Time Scissors, which is a lovely um, DC Comics thing, you know, Time Scissors, which Superman uh, admits, which together could hypothetically be used to cut any geological line from history. So he knows what Lex is, was, is thinking about. Uh, but Lex says, but the eye can also be used to see in, see deep into space and the time scissors to slice away layers of time. And so uh, Lex then starts the planetarium uh, show and Superman's like, what are you doing? What, what are you up to? And then uh, Lex launches into this remembrance where he was a boy when he was uh, when he was a boy in Smallville, and he had this. Uh, oh, this is where he references the fifth season. There's something in towns like Smallville called the fifth season, a period between winter and spring, just a couple of weeks really, when the weather goes crazy, anything can happen. Tornadoes of sunshine and so on. Uh, so then he talks about how his dad was abusive. And so in, in many ways to get away from that, he, he did, he did things like this, where he did these experiments and what he, what he wanted to do, uh, in fourth grade, he says, my lab partner and I built a rudimentary laser in chemistry class. Of course, I was the brains behind it all, but still lasers fired through telescopic lenses are exponentially more powerful. And so I took it here to the planetarium and I sent a message into space an SOS. Uh, he he says uh, he he would he should have died because the nitroglycerin, nitroglycerin that he was using for this laser he had not he hadn't he had not heated it oh sorry nitroglycerin it's liquid nitrogen he didn't heat the liquid nitrogen and when he uh, fired the the laser it should have exploded and killed him but it didn't and the re- we find out the reason why um, is because young Clark Kent uses heat vision to heat up the liquid nitrogen and allowed uh, Lex's message to go out. Superman says, you can still have just, you, you can still have come here just to stargaze, you know, it's still the fifth season. They both say, and then, and then what we see is this, the, the planetarium's thing uh, program is ending because what it's talking about is how the sun, uh, eventually the sun will eat our mercury and then Venus and then earth. And then, our time ends. And so they, like I say, they both say the fifth season, Lex says, I got the eye and the scissors to kill you. So he admits it. Superman says, I know you did Lex, but maybe. And it was that, but maybe part that really threw me. And I was like, what, what's the whole thing? What, what, what is the message of this? What's the theme here? So really to me, the fifth season is like, like Lex says, Lex says, anything can happen. So yes, he did uh, get those things to kill Superman, but this being the fifth season or, you know, him reminiscing about the fifth season, that, that time, it's really just, he wanted to stargaze. He wanted, he, you know, he wants, he wants the companionship. Uh, this is totally me reading into it, but, um, you know, everything dies eventually. And all we have is a short time on earth and all we have are the people in our lives. So, you choose, just like just like Butch in the previous story, you choose what to do with your life here. You do some good things or you choose to do some bad things. So anyway, I, I, I liked it better on reread. Uh, I, you know, if, if I'm going to edit Scott Snyder, I would say, take out that last bit of dialogue. I don't think we needed it. But then again, um, now I'm editing myself. If we end it just on the planetarium's uh, uh, words here and then our time ends it's kind of a downer a bit of a downer ending perhaps and maybe they didn't want to go for that but anyway i i enjoyed it for the interaction between lex and superman uh 
It's interesting though, you know, we have we show the sun or they show the sun in, uh, engulfing the earth as the sun, you know, transforms into a red giant and uh and swallows up the inner planets. Well, the next story <laughs> that's exactly what's happening. Uh the next story is of tomorrow. Written by Tom King, uh Clayman does the art, Jody Belair does beautiful colors on this, really knocking it out of the park. Uh with letters by John Workman. And this is Superman returning to Earth, um, I think, millions of billion, billions of years uh, in the future, uh, because this is when, like I say, the sun expands and, and eats the Earth, so to speak. And Superman is there, uh, beautifully drawn by uh, Clayman, and uh, the colors, like I said, are just, just beautiful in here, conveying that, what's going on uh, with, with the Earth and the sun. But it's Superman here visiting Earth, visiting the grave, graves of his, his uh, foster parents one last time. And we find out, like I say, it's billions of years here, uh, billions of years later. Mankind has moved on away from the Earth. Lois is still around because she, uh, let's see, where is it? She has taken the Eternity formula, which tastes like grape, which... Superman says, which she liked, but it's a lot of years. She's tired of grape. <laughs> ah, and he, you know, he talks, he talks about his son, how, um, how John reminds him of, of his mother, his ma, kind and so damn stubborn. He tells him, uh, obviously I miss you. I love you every day. It doesn't matter how long it's been, it's still every day. He says, look, I don't know if you're here or out there or just gone. Um, So it's probably better that that this is the last time. In the end, as as the earth is being swallowed up, he's uh, he's taken some earth. He he grabs a handful of earth, uh, dirt at the beginning of the story and crushes it into a diamond, which I'm not quite sure that that is how that works. But anyway, I know I know Superman can crush coal into diamond. I've seen that a hundred million times in the comics, but I know it's, it looks just like dirt. Yeah, I don't think you can just press dirt into diamond. Maybe I don't know. It's comic book physics, so obviously. Anyway, but he's taken that diamond and he and he's used his heat vision to create um, a, a little statue of Ma and Pa Kent with him as a youngster, and he lays that down at their gravesite. And he says in the end, as, as I said, as the earth is being swallowed up, we're all stardust fallen. And so we, and so we look to the sky and we wait to be reclaimed. And he says to his parents, and thank you for everything. I just thought it was a really touching story. I really enjoyed that. Uh, the, uh, the, the gravestone or uh, grave plaque says, Kent, Jonathan and Martha, beloved parents and grandparents, you gave us hope. Yes, exactly. They did. I love that. Okay. Uh, next story. Five Minutes by Louise Simonson is the writer. Jerry Ordway. Of course, you have to have uh, Ordway do do some work on this. He, he had a, a long run on Superman there. Dave McKay on colors. Carlos M. Mangual on letters. Uh, this is just one of those, you know, quick, funny little stories. Clark has a, has a deadline. Perry's, you know, breathing, breathing, breathing down his neck. But Superman has things he has to do. And so... <laughs> So even though he's got only five minutes to meet his deadline, Superman is out doing various things uh, and then gets back to the planet to uh, he he just in time, just in the nick of time, you know, as Superman is uh, prone to do, gets it out. He says, just send it to layout chief. It's that's old news, Kent. Superman did this and this and this. I want interviews, first person accounts. Get on it. Get on it, Kent. I'm holding the presses. <laughs> it's cute. Not much to it, but it's cute. It's just nice to see uh, Perry White uh, again in the Superman stories. A lot of the the Superman supporting cast has not been in uh, the stories here in the last few years, at least that I've read. So it's nice to see these characters again. The next story is uh, Action Land by Paul Dini. Pencils by the great Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. Uh, inks by Kevin Nolan, which I can totally tell. Uh, colors by Trish uh, Mul- Mulvihill, uh, letters by Josh Reed. And so it starts off with uh, 
so you see this woman, this red haired woman, uh, uh, welcoming everyone to the, the most thrilling colossal entertainment experience in the galaxy, the fully immersive Superman's action land. And, you know, just, just that, that picture of the, the, the female character here, uh, so is such a Garcia Lopez, uh, drawn character. Um, it was, it was such a delight to, to see that, um, I miss I miss Garcia Lopez's work, and so it was nice to see this here. Anyway, so uh, these people are uh, getting on, you know, uh, um, a Disneyland like uh, cart to ride through the uh, life story of Superman with this this female character narrating. See a lot of things, um, uh, some interesting interaction or uh, reactions by the the the, the human characters here. Uh, just shot the Justice League, some villains, which is where this is where I really see the Kevin Nolan our, uh, inks come out. Uh, so you know it's it's him. Uh, but then, as as uh, the as it says here, the f- uh, the final battle between Superman and his greatest foe, the godlike interdimensional being, Mister Mixius Pitalik. Uh, that's when things kind of fall apart. And what this is, is I guess it's a role play session between Mixie and his, his wife, um, Gypsy. Uh, <laughs> but you know, he's, he gets down in the dumps, but his wife is like, you could will Superman out of existence like that. But once you get started, your mind wanders off into in- infinite what if scenarios. And for a being who can endlessly rewrite reality, that's a lot of ifing. And on a deeper level, I don't think you want the story to end. Ever. And Mixie's like, what? No, that's not... Well, maybe. She says, Superman defines you, well, part of you, the naughty little spark of cosmic mischief that wears a purple hat. Lucky for me, I like that part. Um, And then it ends with with Batmite and the... Oh, I've forgotten what he's called. uh, well, there's a couple other imps here. One of one of which is the um, oh, I've forgotten the character's name. Bad, bad comic fan. Uh, Johnny Thunder. His and his uh, his uh, um, the he says say you and there's the genie that comes out. I can't remember what they what they call that character. <laughs> and then there's this other one, other imp that I don't I, I kind of recognize, but I don't know who it is. So I I, I need to look that up. But anyway. Uh, on the next page, there's a, a nice Walt Simonson, uh, Brennan Wagner pinup of Superman. Um, the sun makes an appearance in the background. I know this, you know, the sun is a huge thing, the, the yellow sun. So there's a lot, a lot of stories involving suns in, the, <laughs> in this book. So that's, I thought it was interesting. Uh, the next story, which is, uh, another of my favorites. This is Faster Than a Speeding Bullet by Brad Meltzer, art by John Cassidy, colors by Laura Martin, letters by Chris Eliopoulos. And, uh, so this basically, uh, it's another hostage situation and it's always a guy, uh, holding a gun to a woman's head. I, I, I'm really tired of that trope, but that's what this is. And, uh, this, uh, unlike the, the, the other guy, the, the, from the, the Maggie Sawyer centric story with Brainiac, this guy is just a bad dude and he's threatening to kill this woman. Um, Superman knows of this, but he's so far away. He says, I won't make it. And as he's as he's getting closer to the city and the situation, he's uh, Superman says, uh, "I see his bronchi dilate. Glucose rushes to his skeletal muscles. His body preparing for what's next." Superman says out loud, "No, I won't make it, but I have to try." And we see the gun. He's fired. The guy's fired the gun, and we see this uh, cool um, uh, inside image of of the the mechanisms of the gun with a bullet being fired out. Superman says, I watched the gunpowder ignite. A femtosecond later, the bullet rotates along the grooves of the barrel. This particular 45 travels 830 feet per second. I know my top speed. I know the distance. I'm close, but this is math. I won't make it. Uh, but then the the um, the victim here, this woman... She does something extraordinary. She leans her weight against the barrel of the gun as the guy fires it. He, as Superman says, into the danger. Uh, it buys her an attosecond. It's not enough to stop the bullet. 
uh, but it does have an impact. Um, so, so as Superman notices this, he says, supersonic becomes hypersonic, then speed, then, then becomes that speed I haven't flown since, since Pa, which I, th- I thought, okay, I'll come back to that. Anyway, so because, because of the woman's actions, Superman is able to get there in time to stop the bullet. She te- he tells her uh, that that was brave, <laughs> to, which, to which she replies, I just did what Batman would. That was a joke. <laughs> Superman good-naturedly uh, uh, takes, takes it good-naturedly and says, I knew that. I mean it, though. You should think about joining the police. She says, you sound like my dad. He says, all of us are here for a reason. Echoing what uh, was was put in Superman the movie with Pa Kent telling his son the same thing, which I thought was really cool. And he Superman flies off the sun in the background, highlighting it, and he says, "Your dad is a smart man." Uh, and so there's a it ends with a conversation between Lois and Clark, uh, and Lois says, "I see that look on your face. You met a good one today, didn't you?" I meet a good one every day. You know what I'm saying, Clark? People always say they're inspired by you, but I know your real secret. You're the one inspired by them. So echoing what I had said earlier about why I love Superman. I will nitpick this story just a, just a, just a tiny bit. Uh, it's interesting. You know, he knows his top speed. He said supersonic becomes hypersonic. You know, that speed he hasn't flown since Pa. Why wasn't he flying at that speed to begin with? Why did he why did he not why did he wait till then to speed up? If he, you know, at the beginning of the story he knows what's going on. Why wasn't he flying hypersonically already? Anyway, but you know, it's still a nice story. I really like this one. It's probably my yeah. It's my second favorite story. No, I don't know. Can't decide between that one or the Tom King story as far as my second one. Probably this one. Right now, I'll say it's this one. <laughs> uh, there's a, there's a, another pinup by Jorge Jimenez with Superman just sitting there in the clouds doing kind of a, the thinker pose. Uh, that's really nice. And then we get the ending story. Um, the Truth by Brian Michael Bendis. Jim Lee doing the pencils. Scott Williams on inks. As always, Alex Sinclair on colors. As always with Jim Lee, at least I think. And Corey Pettit on letters. Um, hmm. So this is supposed to be the introduction uh, to what comes next with Action Comics 1001. Uh, you know, Brian Michael Mendes coming here. I have already talked about on a few times, a few episodes where I am looking forward to what Bendis is going to do to do with Superman, do to Superman, however you want to take it. Uh, just, you know, what his contributions to the Superman mythos will be. Uh, and so this is supposed to be an introduction to that. And I have to say, Mm. Eh. Uh, because, you know, Superman's in a fight with a big alien. And how many times have we, have we seen that? And he is, uh, you know, it's, it's very reminiscent of Doomsday, although this guy is not just a mindless brute. He, 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 the guy talks. He handily is dealing with not just Superman, but Supergirl too. And so... There's a there's a revelation in the end that uh uh he the his name is Rogal Zar and he says I cleanse the galaxy of the Kryptonian plague and I am here to finish the job. Uh the interesting revelation when I first read this was that this is it the Kryptonian sickness finally ends today just like I once promised Jor-El when I destroyed the planet Krypton. So, and it says, to be continued in the Man of Steel miniseries. Um, <sighs> so, like I, like I said, at first it's like, ooh, they're, they're, they're playing around with, you know, who destroyed Krypton again. But, you know, it's again. And, you know, jor had a hand in it. Uh, but we just had a story featuring, featuring jor as Mr. Oz and he wasn't all that he wasn't the the good father uh the savior of or the potential savior of krypton the savior of his son as he's been shown in the past so we're getting a revision of that uh, of the character i don't know it's just 
it's not very original. It's not very innovative. It's kind of same old, same old, but with Brian Michael Bendis character dialogue. So the one thing I did like about this story were the two incidental characters that we'll probably never see again. These two women who are just uh, sitting and chatting uh, as this fight breaks out around them. Superman crashes into into the restaurant and they go help him. You know, they drag him behind this <laughs> behind the the counter to give him to buy him some time. But you know, it's it, despite the you know, or it, I like I like the fact that these these two hu- very frail human characters are helping Superman with this this uber uh, monster type character. Right? They they don't they don't think twice about it. They just help him. So again, it it it, it is it is. Um, Echoing those themes of, you know, Superman inspires and is inspired by the the you know we Earthers. So um, I, I I really like that theme. But uh, you know, it's <laughs> let me give you a sense of the dialogue here. So they're dragging him behind the counter, and one of them is like, "Excuse me, Mister Superman," trying to wake him up, and and the other the other woman says, "Man, he's heavy," which I, is a nice little detail I like. Uh, he's so heavy, you think? He's wearing the red shorts again. I saw. Why? You know, just this is this is this is this is uh, prime Mike, Brian Michael Bendis. Uh, you know, it's I find it funny. I know a lot of people don't uh, that these characters are talking about you know Superman shorts among this dangerous situation. But you know, it's, it's one of the things I like about about Bendis's work. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, it continues. He doesn't look like Superman without the shorts. Shh, he'll hear you. I don't get past his eyes. <laughs> Things like that. Um, uh, uh, again, with the shorts. Without the shorts, it's it's just not him. So you know, a little. I think there's a little meta commentary there going on. But his underwear is on the outside of his clothes. He's an alien from another planet. It might be a symbol of hope to his people. <laughs> that is probably the best line in the whole story. But anyway. Anyway, I, I like those two characters. Uh, yeah, they're it's, it's kind of stupid that they're talking about such things uh, in that situation. But you know, people do weird things in stressful situations. More importantly, they they were helping Superman. So anyway, that's uh, that is Action Comics one thousand. Um, I uh, I have to say I'm I was really looking forward to seeing what Bendis was going to bring to Superman, and now after I mean, if that's the taste. I'm a little leery. So, uh, I, however, I will be getting uh, the Man of Steel miniseries. This, the, I think, the six week, uh, six issue weekly series. I think it is, and then I'll be getting uh, both Superman and Action Comics, starting with number one thousand one. And I'm just going to be tickled pink that uh, again that we have a comic book in the four digits, four digit range now. So, anyway, that's uh, that's my look at Action Comics one thousand. I'd be really interested in hearing your take on uh, any or all of these stories and uh, what you think of the the new direction of Superman going forward. Uh, uh, I want to say go listen to uh, the Never Stay Dead podcast. They did a a, a, a spotlight on Action Comics 1000. Uh, I know Wednesday Comics also did that as well. I'm sure other people uh, have uh, have done their take on uh, this particular issue. So, you know, I encourage you go, go go check out those other podcasts, listen to what they have to say, uh, compare it to what I have to say, and I want to know what you have to say about Action Comics 1000 and the stories within. Uh, if you'd like to let me know what you th- what you think about those things, you can email me at longboxreview at gmail.com, uh, or you can leave comments at the blog, as always, longboxreview.com, or just hit me up on Twitter at longboxreview. So with that, I will leave you, and thank you for listening, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.